Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts Millennium Stage. Tonight's panel, Game Design, Behind the Screen, is a part of the Kennedy Center's Nordic Cool 2013 Festival. Nordic Cool 2013, curated by Alicia Adams, Vice President of International Programming, will be taking place throughout the Kennedy Center February 19th through March 17th. And we will be hosting performances here each night on the Millennium Stage, so please be sure to come out and join us for another one. The festival is presented in cooperation with the Nordic Council of Ministers and Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. Additional support is provided by the HRH Foundation, the Honorable Bonnie McElvin Hunter, Mrs. Marilyn Carlson Nelson and Dr. Glenn Nelson, the Barbara Osher Prosuasia Foundation, David M. Rubenstein and the State Plaza Hotel. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator for this evening, Mike Snyder. Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming to the Nordic Cool Festival and coming to our panel on video game design and behind the scenes. And uh, I would guess a few of you play video games, possibly? <laughs> Well, you're in the right place. Good, awesome. Um, we're fortunate to have two uh, veterans of the video game industry. Each in his own way has left their own Nordic impression on today's ever-changing video game scene. So Saku Lehtinen has been the art director at Remedy Games since 2002. Among the games he's helped create are Max Payne and Alan Wake. Saku? <laughs> Christopher Turborg is in his fifth year at CCP in Reykjavik, Iceland, where he is the lead game designer of EVE Online, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game now in its second decade of operation. <laughs> so to start our discussion today, uh, Saku and Christopher are gonna give us, gonna take us to their, uh, virtually take us to their studios, give us a behind the scenes look at how things are done. So take us to Remedy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, a brief look at the remedy and what we've done. So, actually, are we broadcasting? There we go, uh, my slides. So, uh, briefly about me. I started very long time ago now, it seems. Uh, I'm 39 years old, but uh, it's 24 years ago, I think, I published my first game. 89. Uh, so I've been in the industry ever since. Um, I've quickly joined the scene, which we might brush uh, by later. Uh, but that was kind of my, I don't know, high school or university to game design and working with programmers and working with kind of multifaceted development processes. Um, then I thought that games can't ever be a proper profession. So I entered the architecture, faculty of architecture at the Helsinki University of Technology and actually, in addition to studying, ended up teaching there for about 10 years. Uh, but that was a really good design school uh, that kind of married technology uh, and design and kind of like the only place I could figure out where those two things were kind of meeting up. But then it turned out that actually was a possible career choice to go to games. So I uh, joined Remedy already in 96, so what, 17 years ago or so. And I've been, I was a level designer and one of the artists. And when we finally established a position of art director, uh, I, I took that role and I've been rather uh, cross-disciplined, uh, working with programmers, uh, creating our tools and technology, uh, working 2D graphics, creating the brand, the looks uh, of the marketing stuff, for instance. But my main task, obviously, has been to design the games, design the levels, the environments, with my background in architecture, obviously. And I also uh, directed quite a bit. I've studied some film and uh, related. So uh, I've been directing, for instance, the in-game cinematics of both Max Payne games. Um, so Max Payne is definitely one of the most famous ones. Uh, even a movie was made uh, later, but uh, they've been out about 10 years ago. 
And then the reason bigger title we released was obviously Alan Wake 2010. And we've also moved to iOS. And uh, Death Rally is a game we did originally in 96. And we made a new iOS version just recently. And then there's been a digital download uh, version of, of kind of a spin off of Alan Wake called The American Nightmare. And we're currently working on future generation consoles and iOS projects. Uh, I, with my background again in architecture, I got the really nice task of designing our new offices or actually a renovation. Uh, it's an old building, but we got the chance to renovate. We recently moved in, so this is in Helsinki, uh, or technically it's the neighboring town Espoo uh, in Finland. And uh, it's a quite swanky new place, even if I say so myself. Um, briefly about the timeline, so 95, Remedy got found, uh, founded. Death Rally, the first version, shareware version for PC, then the both Max Paints, uh, then the Alan Wake later. We've been always uh, focusing more on the quality over quantity, I think. Uh, it has taken quite a long time always to uh, get things right, but uh, our specialty has been to kind of have focused relatively small team uh, doing Kind of like uh, we've, been, we've been focusing more on the IP and uh, kind of a, uh, trying to find a way to be original rather than making stuff that what everybody else is doing. And we've tried to leave our mark in that way. And I think we've been rather successful, I guess. Uh, we have now done three bigger IPs. Uh, Death Rally being the one which has been downloaded over 10 million times. And then Max Payne's and Alan Wake combined also have been kind of AAA games on consoles and PC, as, you, as they say, usually AAA games. Uh, they've also been uh, like 10 million copies around. Um, so, we and we've been topping the charts uh, from time to time quite nicely. Um, then uh, I'll play a video, about three minutes. Uh, it's kind of the background of or, or the design approaches of, of uh, Alan Wake. And I thought it would explain pretty well of uh, how we kind of approach the games and what's important for us. Uh, there's probably some shooting around there. I see a lot of kids in the audience. but. <laughs> Uh, they're just figments of uh, Alan Wake's imagination, so no real people get killed. It was teen rage, by the way. All right, let's roll. One of the most anticipated titles of 2010, Alan Wake will set the bar in cinematic story-driven action. Alan Wake aims to create a unique thriller experience. The game seamlessly blends fierce cinematic action with a gripping storyline where things can happen unexpectedly at any time. In order to create the game's unique action, Remedy's goal was to integrate the themes of light and darkness into the combat. The dark presence that threatens Wake is possessing the local townsfolk, and Wake's shadowy enemies seem invincible under the cover of darkness. Before the player can fight them, he first needs to burn away the darkness with light. The use of light as a gameplay element is integrated tightly into the action elements of the game. A handheld flare gives you a momentary safe haven. Flashlights and batteries become an important resource, and even military-grade searchlights can become the key to survival. The gameplay provides variety, with a multitude of enemies, vehicles, poltergeists, and other threats, as the dark presence grows in power, the player will never know what to trust, as even the most innocent, inanimate object can come to life and turn into a threat. In addition to flashlights and weapons, the player will have to cleverly use the environment in order to survive. The action is paced with environmental puzzles, collectibles, and story-driven content. I'm Barry Wheeler. His agent. This is where the game's supporting cast comes into play. Everyone, uh, 
Like Remedy's Max Payne games, Alan Wake is thick with pop culture references. Among others, Remedy lists Stephen King, Lost, and Twin Peaks as their influences. The game creates a suspenseful, unique thriller experience, only seen to date in film and TV, with the kind of chilling atmosphere, powerful narrative, twists and cliffhangers that modern audiences have come to expect. The game's lead character, Alan Wake, is a best-selling writer suffering from a writer's block. While vacationing in the idyllic small town of Bright Falls, Wake finds himself trapped in a nightmare. His wife, Alice, goes missing, and he keeps finding pages from a book he can't even remember writing, and the words are coming true before his eyes. Remedy is also setting the bar high with their soundtrack. The custom-composed cinematic score is combined with the use of licensed songs to create a strong atmosphere. Alan Wake is by far the biggest single-player experience that Remedy has created, and to ensure that every player is provided with an optimal gameplay experience, the game constantly monitors the player's progress and adjusts the difficulty on the fly, maintaining a sweet spot that is suitably challenging. After years of development, the result is a heart-pounding single-player thrill ride that raises the bar in storytelling with a wealth of suspense, twists, and cliffhangers. I guess that pretty much sums it up uh, what we've always been uh, kind of after. It's been cinematic games with strong lead characters like Max Payne, Alan Wake. There's always a, uh, some twist in the gameplay like bullet time in Max Payne and, and the use of light in, in uh, Alan Wake. So meaningful games that try to go under your skin uh, and, and an experience which you kind of can live and like, let's say, the best of the movies or, or something like that. All right, thank you. I'll give the stage. Next. So Christopher is going to take us to CCP in Iceland. All right, thank you very much. I think I have a presentation here as well. Let's see. There we go. All right, so uh, I'm with uh, CCP Games. We're uh, based in Iceland, where spaceships come from. I mean, everyone knows that. Um, so I'm half Danish, half Swedish. I've been in Iceland now for five years uh, with CCP. Um, I'm the lead game designer. I think the really simple version of, of my job would be that, that I'm responsible for coming up with the stuff that we put into the game although I'd also kind of be lying because it's a bit more granular uh, than that, but like we, we can kind of keep it at that. So, so I'm responsible for uh, the direction the gameplay goes in, uh, in in our game. And of course, I'm also a, a really big nerd, uh, but uh, I don't think you can really work in this industry without being that. Um, so I'm with CCP Games. Um, it's been around since two, uh, 1997. Uh, they start out making an Icelandic board game, uh, which they use to, to partially uh, fund a video game called EVE Online, which has been around now for, for 10 years. It's our 10th anniversary this year, and uh, through some feat of magic, we've, uh, the game has continually grown for 10 years, uh, which uh, not really any other MMOs have managed to do, uh, so we're really happy with that. Uh, there's around 500 of us. Uh, we're in Iceland, we're in America, we're in China, and we're in the UK, and uh, we're, we're looking to expand. We have two new games uh, coming, and uh, we uh, were initially published um, by another company, but they went bankrupt and we bought our IP back, which has, has, uh, has really, really helped us. Uh, something I'll, I'll get into in a little bit. But uh, So the studio itself, I don't think it's as interesting as the games we do. Uh, our first game that came out in 2003 is EVE Online. It's still running. Uh, what we did in 2003, and, and uh, we still try to kind of push the boundaries of, 
of what you can do. And we made an MMO that's on a single server. Uh, in a lot of other games, you'll end up uh, logging in and you'll select a server. It'll be regional. Uh, in EVE Online, uh, you're essentially playing with everyone else that's playing the game without exception. So uh, that was kind of our feat. And it's, a, it's, it's a, what we call a sandbox game where you can uh, kind of tailor things together how you want it. We try to not interfere. And there's kind of an interesting social dynamic. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, our latest trailer, which actually captures that fairly good. Uh, um, when you watch this trailer, then the characters in here are meant to be players, essentially. So uh, the NPCs or kind of the AI or computer-driven uh, uh, part of you isn't really as interesting as the people in there. But I'm going to uh, show you a quick uh, scene from our game. This is Vic. He just made the mistake of his life. On any given day, Vic preys on the weak and gets away with it. But this time, he picked the wrong target. See, those miners were part of the resource division of a large corporation, the key moneymaker for a major industrial alliance, led by one of the wealthiest men in the galaxy. With a bounty that high, he has to run. Because everybody with a trigger finger and a taste for cash will be coming after him. Some he can fight off. Others he can outmaneuver. But today, Vic is about to get caught by the most savage hunter of them all. Me. Retribution. Revenge is just the beginning. Try for free at trial.eveonline.com. All right. Thank you. So, so that's, a, that's our first game. It came out in 2003, and we're, we're really proud that we're keeping it up to date, so it doesn't really look like a game that came out in 2003. That's, that's part of, uh, I think, how we keep it fresh. What we decided afterwards was that um, it would be a good idea to make a uh, FPS, a shooter for PlayStation, and tie it into our PC MMO. And uh, if that sounds a little bit crazy, that's probably because I guess it was really a bad idea. Like, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't make that much sense, but now that it's working for us, it seems like a great idea. But it's, it's taken us a, a few years to get there, and uh, that's our new title that's coming out this year ca called Dust 514, uh, which is, um, a, a PlayStation shooter uh, that'll tie into EVE Online. And I'm going to show you the, the launch trailer we have. It's, it's coming out uh, this summer. So, so this is basically our launch trailer tying it into EVE Online. And if you recognize some of the like, art and characters, then it is because the two games are essentially connected. So you'll have one person flying a spaceship on a PC, and you'll have one person uh, playing uh, a shooter on the PlayStation. And those games will work together. begin this life alone. But there are others exactly like you. You make friends. You forge alliances. You adapt and strategize. And together, you make the battle your own. Your victories attract attention. People rally to your cause. And soon enough, you realize you don't have to join an army. You can make one. You can fight for wealth, 
He can fight for power. Whatever the cause, remember that just like you, your enemy doesn't fight alone. So that kind of brings us to present day, right? So we have this PlayStation shooter and we have this PC spaceship game uh, that are now connected and uh, like it says, you can, you can go try it out if you want to. And, uh, and it's really fairly neat. I can promise you that, that when you sit in a spaceship and someone in another game calls in an airstrike and you bomb that from a totally different game, you will get the biggest nerd boner you've ever had. <laughs> So anyway, so that kind of takes us to present day, right? The last thing I want to show you before we go to the discussion is that I want to show you uh, kind of the future of CCP. Uh, a while ago, uh, we uh, merged with a company uh, called White Wolf that, um, that have World of Darkness and Vampire the Masquerade. And, uh, and that's something we've kind of kept very tight um, because we haven't really had a lot uh, to publicly show yet. Uh, but this year is going to be the year where we really start showing people what we're working on, and that's going to be our third game uh, scheduled to come out uh, at some point in the future. And I just want to show you uh, a little trailer that I don't think we've shown publicly before, but uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's uh, what's going to be coming from CCP. You won't believe me. In fact, I shouldn't tell you. Some secrets are best taken to the grave. They're all around us. They control everything. They have always been here, waging their secret wars, devouring anything that stands in their way. Cast out of Eden, their souls discarded, their flesh made immortal each a font of undying power tortured by their boundless appetites. We belong to them. Tonight, I was taken. was a, a, a quick 10-minute crash course in CCP games. Um, awesome. Should we swap around? Right, we're going to do a little musical chairs here. And we're going to have questions. Hopefully, you guys have some questions. But I'm going to ask a few questions of the guys here. But you can um, we'll have a microphone out after a bit. And hopefully, you'll have some questions. If you're watching on the internet, you can uh, send me a question via Twitter to at Mike Snyder. S-N-I-D-E-R, we'll get you that way. So you can see both these companies, you know, have been delivering, you know, top-notch, world-class game experiences. Um, for the beginning of our discussion, I think since we're at Nordic Cool, maybe you could talk a bit about, are there aspects of the games that you think are genuinely Nordic in nature? You know, and is that subconscious, conscious? Uh, so, so I mean, I, I think we have a we have a fairly kind of complex and 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 uh, I wouldn't say hard to digest, but I mean, you have to go into it 
uh, wanting to try this out and don't expect to be entertained. And I think that that falls fairly well into kind of the Nordic video game uh, making. Like, I I'm not terribly surprised that stuff like uh, Minecraft and, and, and other games of that type come from the Nordic countries. I think there's, a, uh, there's very much an appetite to make games that challenge people and, and that take some getting into. And I mean, EVE Online is, is, is not a simple game to get into. It's, it's a fairly complex game and, and we're pretty cognizant that we maybe won't have everyone stay in our game that tries it out. And, and, and we're, we're perfectly all right with that. I mean, EVE isn't for everyone. Uh, it's for people who really want something uh, challenging, something they're invested in. And, and, and I think that fits uh, really all our games. Our, our new uh, Dust 514, the shooter, um, kind of has a, a level of depth that no other shooters have. And for some people, uh, that might not be what they want. But, but we'll hopefully catch a crowd that want a little bit more out of their shooters. <clears throat> maybe take it take this to a bit of a generic level for a while. I, uh, it's kind of intriguing times for the Nordic countries, considering the games. It seems that we've become this game designing superpower almost, at least considering uh, how kind of like comparing to the population, we seem to have a quite a big um, presence in the whole gaming community, thinking, for instance, in Finland at the moment, well, Remedy is sort of a, the grand old man of, of uh, kind of the first company which, which made international success from Finland and almost from any Nordic country. Uh, but we have the newcomers, we have the new platforms like the iOS, uh, we have Rovio, for instance, with their Angry Birds. You, some of you probably heard of that game, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe. And if you look at the, for instance, for, again from Finland, if you look at the charts, uh, the top crossing app for months, I think, has been also a Finnish game uh, made a company called Supercell and Class of Clans is the name of the game. And they're not a game, Heyday has also been there. So, uh, and we've had our share of, of uh, number one position back in, back in the day with Death Rally, for instance. So it seems that when you look at top 10 Angry Birds here, Angry Birds there, there's a lot of games from Finland and also from elsewhere in uh, Nordic countries. Minecraft, you mentioned, it's uh, obviously. So w w when we come down to the question, like, uh, uh, is there anything special? Uh, well, I think all of these games, to me, seem rather a uh, bit like what Remedy has tried to do is, is try to take a kind of a unique position. Uh, uh, like it, we come from a small country. So it makes no sense to make a game which everybody else is making. Mm. So, so let's try to find new ways of gaming, new niches. Uh, we have a very, very strong kind of a community uh, and also I think probably the education, education system and, and the background uh, also in that. Well, I, I mentioned demo scene uh, previously. It's, it's been a strong influence in Finland and, and uh, creating a kind of a platform where you have a, like a really skilled guys who have been doing this for decades now, actually, even though they aren't that old. It, it just struck me now that you, know, you go through these Finnish games. I've been buying a lot of Finnish games without knowing it. <laughs> like old Death Rally stuff, Supercell, it's, it's cool. What, you might want to tell people a bit about the uh, demo scene you talked about. I mean, and it, it, it comes intrinsically from the population centers and being spread about. You want to take a second to, to tell people what you're talking about there in case they don't know. Well, uh, demo scene is a, is a thing which I was active and uh, it was, it kind of blossomed on, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s uh, when I was about high school age or so. Uh, and um, it, it came from the 80s when there was games. Uh, well, the games started to come around. There were computers like Amiga or C64. Uh, and young kids not having much money uh, we're obviously trying to find ways to, well, uh, copy the games. Uh, if the friend bought a game, I want to try it too, can I make a copy? And then soon there was copy protections, and when you have young kids, 
uh, and a copy protection. And again, uh, that's the best motivation. You can probably tell them that let's get, let's get cracking. Uh, let's uh, try to get around that copy protection and learn programming. Uh, and pretty soon people wanted to kind of, it, it wasn't the piracy of, of today, like big industry thing. It was uh, more like, a, hey, here's an obstacle. I want to go around it. And uh, then a demo scene emerged from that background later towards the 90s when uh, the guys who uh, like uh, cracked the game and made it available to everybody, the copy protection was removed. Uh, they added a small intro that, hey, it was me who, who did it and people always used pseudonyms. For instance, my pseudonym was Owl, the bird. And, and uh, everybody was just using what there was called the scene handle because it was cool. Uh, and, uh, but uh, hacker scene basically and, and very strong subculture and the demo scene kind of, uh, kind of split it from the cracker, cracking culture uh, through the fact that eventually some people just made demos like bigger and bigger, like cool programming music graphics came together and we were trying to push the machines as, as hard as possible, kind of like even if there was a design flaw in the hardware, we tried to find a way to utilize that in a demo and wow the crowd and the crowd had to know kind of like what you're doing. I once, uh, I think I made a parallel once where it was a bit like the hip hop scene uh, where you kind of have the graffiti guys and the musicians and the dancers. Now it just virtually just came together on a computer screen. And because people live quite far apart, uh, you send the demos with traditional mail on a disc and people look at them and there's greetings and there's information and you make your demo and then it's a sort of a your piece that you put out. And it was tens of thousands of people in the Nordic countries and also in, the, in Germany. That was the majority of the scene. And uh, it was really the breeding ground for, for uh, programmers and making games because the first time uh, programmers, musicians, and, and if something is fueled by respect or desire for respect, that's much stronger motivator than uh, probably any money would be. So that's the background of the demos. So it kind of helped create an organic situation which today we see we have what we have. Yeah, well, for, for, well Remedy is a good example yeah. because uh, Future Crew may be familiar to somebody who might know mm -hmm. the scene, I don't know. Uh, uh, one of the most famous PC groups out there and, and myself was working on the uh, Atari ST, etc. So we kind of came together and figured out we have these skills. Uh, maybe we can use it for something useful. How about making games? And that's where Remedy kind of got in 95. After our scene years, we, we formed Remedy. You know, here at this festival, we've, other places are being talked about. Nordic films, Nordic music, Nordic games. Do they, you know, one more time, let's talk about, is there an aesthetic that, for instance, that uh, a Battlefield game made by DICE out of Sweden is different, has a different aesthetic than a Call of Duty game. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. I think this might be more of an art director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, well, maybe, first of all, what I see, at least in, in most of the games, or what, what we try to do is, Set of certain aim for perfection, if you will, like really dissecting what this is about and what what makes this game good. And uh, there's there's a strong pride. I think that uh, derives from from the design heritage of of Nordic countries, Scandinavia. Like there's very design-oriented cultures. You, you're, from, for instance, from Denmark, where even the traffic signs are designed and, and every chair is a design piece, almost. So, so there's a, this desire of, of really make good stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, maybe there's a slight, I don't know, uh, 
twist towards a bit of a darkness, at least mm -hmm. when we were looking at yeah. the videos we just saw. Uh, maybe it's the dark winters, I don't know. It, yeah, I mean, I, th I think there might absolutely be, be an element of that. And I think also, uh, at least for, for if you look at Danish film culture, social realism has, has, has always kind of been uh, the cornerstone of, of the stuff we do. And, and I guess when you look at uh, stuff like Battlefield, when you look at, uh, I mean, even though we're sci-fi, we still try to keep kind of in the range of, of realism, right? So, so it's, it's not necessarily uh, like flying space dragons. It's like how we think these spaceships will look like. So I think there might, for, for a lot of games, be, um, be at least in terms of how they look, uh, kind of going for a more uh, realistic look than, than maybe more cartoony fantasy-ish. Scandinavian functionalism, yes, as yes, you, would, yes. you, you would say. <laughs> Good. Well, talk a bit about when you guys create a game, mm. you want it to be an international game, right? You're yes. not just, you're not looking to sell this to no. domestically, you're looking beyond, what, how does that affect what you do? Yeah, so um, I, I think it, it, it affects us uh, more and more, I think. Of course, there's, uh, there's different markets and different uh, uh, groups of people you have to kind of pay attention to. So, uh, so when I said that, that part of my job is coming up with, uh, with what goes into a game, um, it's not just like waking up in the morning, having an idea and putting it into a video game. Uh, of course, there, there's a bit more of, uh, of who do we reach with what product, right? So, um, so we see a lot of cultural tendencies uh, in different countries. Um, we'll see that uh, group PvP, for example, which is basically players getting together and fighting other players. Um, we see that, that Scandinavian players uh, really like that. Um, being very industrious, building things in our game, uh, we see uh, more from, from, from countries like Germany, for example, uh, that they're into. So, so there's a lot of considerations you have to, you have to take, take into account. Frequently you'll see uh, single player features being something that, that, that the, our Asian players are more interested in. And, and there, there's just all these, uh, all these things you really have to think about. Uh, I think there's also a little bit of, of looking around and seeing at what what's the industry standard, like what is the, the minimum bar you need to provide people uh, in the US, for example, compared to what they're used to. Uh, I mean, that's not to say that, uh, that you, you go out and do what everyone else does. I think, I think especially uh, CCP has been really, really good at doing new things. Uh, sometimes it's, it's gone, gone uh, not so well, but, but a lot of the time it, it's gone really well, and I, I think that's important. And I think that's also maybe part of uh, being in a, uh, a bit of an isolated game culture, right? So. Uh, so if you're in a game studio uh, in LA, there's tons of other game studios around. You'll go out, you'll meet other people. In Iceland, there's just water, like <laughs> thousands and thousands of miles of water. There's, there's no one I can talk to about games in another studio there. And, and of course, that has its disadvantages because you're not part of, of this big community that, that kind of gets together. But it also has kind of uh, uh, the plus side of us having to come up with something on our own and not really having... Uh, having kind of a, a culture that kind of homogenizes uh, what we do, and uh, uh, and I think it, it's it's it doesn't at all surprise me that like the only single server MMO, uh, the only game to connect into to another to another uh, machine like the PS3 3 comes out of that. It's um, uh, th th there's a bit of element of, of of being isolated and having to come up with uh, with other things. I, I think there's also some functional things like. Uh, uh, a lot of countries are, are kind of catching on and, and offering tax incentives for, for game companies to move there and open studios. Uh, I know that in Denmark, for example, uh, tax incentives isn't really something you tend to give uh, to lure people to your country. So, uh, so, so while they may uh, be a choice that, that's deselected in terms of, of big corporations that make games moving there, uh, that kind of ensures that any success that comes from Denmark will be like a local kind of homegrown thing. So. Uh, I think that there's just a ton of, of different things that impact it. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, thinking of, again, like, uh, for instance, Finland with a population of 5 million, it's um, not just commercially viable to even consider doing a game mm. just for that crowd. Uh, for instance, Remedy, like all the others we were, we've mentioned before, it's just directly to the international market. And I, I, I've been thinking about it a few times, like what, why Nordic countries, why Finland? And um, I think, first of all, uh, 
television incidentally has a, a lot of influence in that because uh, Nordic countries typically don't uh, dub the, the, any of the TV shows or movies. We have subtitles and we hear and listen a lot, a lot of the stuff for instance comes from America and United States uh, so we follow the same TV shows we we uh, pretty much have the same access to the same popular culture stuff than anyone else out here for instance and somehow uh, at least I've always thought that that helps in seeing kind of like what the trends are for instance we are making a lot of nods toward variety of popular culture things and um, it's really kind of inspired by that what we see and uh, it also maybe helps sometimes to be sort of a access to the full access to Western popular culture but still slightly outsider because then you can kind of start making some sort of a whole uh, entities out of them and then drawing the lines and, and uh, producing a maybe a unique take it's sort of a at least I felt that there's kind of an echo going back and forth over the Atlantic Ocean and, and certain cultural things and ideas come back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if we were to make a, a game for the Icelandic market, we currently have more people paying a monthly subscription to email online than there are limits in Iceland. Gotcha. I mean, <laughs> we have 500,000 subscribers, Iceland has 320,000 people. <laughs> yeah. uh, definitely want to look beyond uh, the border. Yeah, you have to. For the business model, good. How have video games become part of pop culture and everyday life and entertainment consumption mm -hmm. in your home countries as, it, as I feel it is here in the United States? Yeah, I, I think it absolutely has. I, I, when I went to university, I, uh, uh, someone gave me like one of those uh, little postcards that said video games are the new movies. Uh, I mean, I, 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 they don't necessarily fill the same role, but, but I definitely think that they are. Uh, they are as important, if not more important now. And I mean, we're seeing so uh, try on out in San Diego or doing something called Defiance, which is uh, uh, a new show on sci-fi uh, coupled to their video game. Uh, and I think they're the first to do that, and I think that's going to be really interesting. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I, I believe the games industry probably makes more a year than it the It makes the more than industry. box office, yeah, definitely. Does, if yes. you add in the, the, yeah. all the other pay TV yeah. and, and uh, DVD and Blu-ray, yeah. It's higher, but yeah, the box office it, yeah. it's more than twice. Usually. Yeah, it's uh, kind of re remembering the old days when we started making games 10, 15 years ago. It was like there was this constant aura, if you will, from the parents and whatnot. Like, come on, guys, get a real job and stop playing those monster thingies. What you that's what you probably what you're doing there. We don't really know and we don't really care. Uh, and that has clearly kind of uh, gone by a long time ago. It's now uh, it's obvious that when you see and hear and see the numbers, it's, there's no question about it that uh, games are the new medium. And at least for me, because I'm, I've been interested in directing and, and uh, doing architecture and actually also working on the music and audio side of the of the uh, game uh, so it's been a dream come true for me it's uh, it's the only medium where I can kind of like put all these things together and be an interactive uh, kind of imagine well I, I like architecture for instance and and part of that is is to kind of understand how people for instance, use the space. They come there, they see certain things, they use it for certain purpose. For instance, a home can be a background for, I don't know, a party or a, um, a variety of things. So that's very much what, what games are, a medium where you can interactively talk mm -hmm. uh, with people and, and when you're successful, kind of like seeing that people enjoy and follow what you thought they would do. That's, that's the great kick which you get out of it, really. And I mean, it's, it's also like a super flexible medium. Like, 
uh, you know, movies haven't really changed that much in the sense that, you know, they're an hour and a half long, you can watch them at home or you can watch them in the movies. Uh, but, but games are, are a completely different beast. I mean, uh, you can sit on the bus and play an iOS game. Uh, you can go home and, and spend uh, 15 hours on World of Warcraft. Don't do that. I think <laughs> that might be overdoing it a little bit. Uh, pace yourselves. But like, th th there's just it's so flexible. Like, uh, you can you can do it multiplayer. You can do it alone. It's just a medium that that I feel really has done very well in in reaching uh, all kinds of different people in all kinds of different situations. So uh, I, th I think that alone is just a, a gigantic advantage and. Uh, we've been seeing the free-to-play games uh, come out over the past few years, and, uh, and I think that, that that's an even more interesting step in the direction that you're basically uh, getting entertainment for free until you choose for it not to be free. So, uh, it, just super flexible. Well, we're getting, we've got less than 15 minutes left. But is there any questions from the audience? I think we have a microphone back here, and uh, she's going to make her way to you so we can hear your question. Thank you for coming to Conrad Cool. I'm so excited to hear you guys, and I'm wondering if um, we're looking at the present time, what would you say would be the picture in one year and in five? Do you see, for example, the integration with Google Vision or virtual reality, or how do you see it changing? Is it gonna be more um, mobile? I'm curious your, to hear your thoughts, thank you. Uh, so I, I, I definitely think that, that not just mobile, but also uh, device integration, like uh, like I said, so we see Defiance, a TV show tying into uh, into a console game. We have a PC game that ties into um, ties into uh, uh, a PlayStation game, and and it's funny if I can kind of draw a parallel to how people communicate today, right? So, uh, so my mom will say, "I'll send you a Facebook message," or "I'll send you uh, a text message on the phone," but young people will just say, "I'll send you a message." And I think that's going to go for entertainment as well. Uh, I think it's not really going to matter uh, what device you're on. It doesn't really matter what kind of game you're playing. It'll have some sort of uh, integration into another medium, and we're just going to consider it the game. Uh, I th think that's part of it. I think the other thing we're going to see uh, is uh, sharing, uh, not just in terms of the same kind of social revolution we've had with Facebook where we share everyday things, but also in terms of putting it on a much bigger stage, right? So we have companies like Riot Games kicking off eSports. Uh, I, I, walked into, uh, I walked into a hotel in, in, in Vegas, into a sports bar uh, this year, and, and it was the semifinals of the League of Legends like Season 2 World Cup. And I was so annoyed they were showing baseball. I was like, who watches baseball? That's like, uh, you know, I, I, th I think that part is going to kick off a lot. It, it's going to be something that, that we share more, it's going to be something that we watch more, and it's going to be basically on every single device. Well, and you, and you see with uh, Activision's last uh, Call of Duty game, they have, you know, podcasting, uh, codcasting, they call it, where you can put your game mm. on the internet and you can let people watch you. They're trying to get people mm. to be interested in mm. being in esports themselves. You know, like taking basically the old uh, basketball intramurals and basketball leagues or bowling leagues and moving it to video games, so to make it more part of the average gamer's lifestyle. Uh, well, I, I'm thinking that digital distribution, which is greatly increasing, well, iOS is a good platform, probably most of you or very many of you have had Apple products and you download apps and, uh, and that's been happening on the, on the console with Steam and a variety of, so, a variety of devices, so it's it's interesting development and, and as a developers it's a interesting times because at least for for a while again small developers in the games can have access to consumers uh, pretty directly and I think there's even a parallel to YouTube in there like if you have a popular video uh, everybody's gonna watch the Gangnam Style or whatever uh, and somehow Harlem Shake the today. Oh, Harlem Shake. <laughs> Harlem Shake. We spoke about it <laughs> to, uh, earlier today. Uh, so, so it's gonna add the accumulation probably of quite a lot. Uh, if somebody's playing something, the information about that being cool is quickly spread it, or it goes top of the charts. People are usually a bit lazy; they click the one which is already topping the charts. So it's gonna be even more 
on top of the charts. So it's going to be kind of like very uh, fast and, and interesting also for developers. So uh, and I, I also think a niche has a chance again, a bit like with uh, iTunes, I think, or, or, or certain other digital distribution medias have done with the music that you finally can access that band which you always were trying to find from your local record, record store but couldn't find it, they never had it, but now you actually have it in digital format there, so that kind of trends are probably gonna just increase and you, you see in them already. Next question. Hey. Uh, I had a specific question about EVE Online because it's such a massive game. Uh, what's the company's philosophy when it comes to staying hands off with what the players are doing with the game and you know, when you want to intervene in that game playing experience and for what reasons? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, our game, as, as, as mentioned before, is kind of a sandbox game where we give players an environment to do stuff. Uh, we try to stay as hands off as humanly possible of course, if someone does anything in game that would break uh, a law in real life, we, we have to step in. But, but I mean, and sometimes it's a little bit painful because it's it can be like, uh, like a car crash, right? You're standing there watching, and you're like, uh oh, this is like a little bit awkward for us. But but we have a principle, and it's uh, I think us staying hands off for ten years now is is why the game is doing so well. Uh, there, every now and then, I'll sit in a meeting room, and we'll be like, all right, we have to do something about this. But, but we've kind of kept our heads cool and, and not really interfered. And, and I think that's why, why the game is, is so much fun. And, and I'd say the reason that we're, where I don't think that kids should be playing you online, uh, we have an age restriction on it, and, and I think that's fully justified, is that it is, like, like you say, like people can do things in EVE Online that, that might not be morally right. And, and, uh, and we don't have a lot of blood spatter and, and murder in our game, but we do have people that are basically uh, allowed to behave uh, kind of how they morally feel. And I mean, some people will be morally outrageous in the game, and I think that'll be part of it. Uh, uh, we basically let people build these gigantic communities, and, and, and when you have a, a clan or a guild or an alliance or however you, you call it that has 10,000 people in it and, and you're kind of trying to take space from other people, th then those ambitions might might uh, step on some people on the way. And, and, and I think that's what makes EVE Online great, but, but sometimes it, it can be a little bit scary to watch as well, but yeah. Somebody down in front has been, had their hands up from the get-go. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, Saku, you talked a little bit about how Remedy was influenced by a lot of American popular culture. Um, do you think Remedy or do you think CCP would ever make a game based more on traditional Nordic culture, like a la Skyrim or something like that? Well, uh, we have, we have uh, always tried to make the, could I say, mainframe or the framework of the game perhaps more familiar to also American audience or let's say familiar from popular culture. Uh, and that's a, it's a good approach because you can easily uh, project a lot of stuff into your game and people expect certain things and we've tried to figure out that what makes something cool in a let's say movie and, and uh, kind of like really dissect what's the cool thing and then we try to figure out how would you play it and not just transfer whatever is there just to really inter intellectually think that uh, when it's an interactive medium rather than the passive medium of movie, uh, how should it work? Uh, but uh, we've always also uh, kind of injected a lot of uh, Nordic stuff in there. For instance, Alan Wake is, is Pacific Northwest, which is in many ways uh, has the same flavor than uh, Scandinavia and Northern Europe. Uh, I often say that Pacific Northwest is, is just like Finland but on steroids uh, <laughs> with all the trees and everything uh, being so big. Uh, we have Max Payne had a lot of Norse mythology on it and that's probably due to Sam Lake, our writer, being so into it in his teens. So he wanted to put a lot of that in there and, and there was 
uh, a lot of parallels in the game's storyline to the Norse mythology and a lot of references there. So we constantly try to try to do our bit, but maybe maybe we haven't been quite so bold to take something completely uniquely uh, Finnish or whatever, and, and just to make game out of it. We haven't either, and I, I'll, I'll be honest, if we ever make a Viking game, I'll die from shame. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it would be too, like, obvious. But, I mean, of course, we take a load of stuff that's kind of subtle, right? So, uh, the last time I was, I was looking at, at some of the, the production for, for our shooter, Dust, uh, the new map they were making was basically based off an Icelandic landscape. And they kind of changed some colors so you couldn't see. So it looked, um, actually, Iceland does look kind of like a moony landscape. Uh, and they kind of taken that and put it in, right? So, so there's a lot of, of, of subtle things. There's a lot of things in it that, that make it very Nordic. But, but I hope we'd never go out and do something that's like over the top. Look at how Viking we are. That would just be. Uh, I, I think we met uh, when we were photographing for uh, Alan Wake. We met some of the Valve guys, and they had just recently done uh, Half-Life 2 photographic trip to Europe. Uh -huh. And I think we met at the bar, and they were laughing to us that. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you would come down and make a game about this region? And we were like, yeah, uh, would it be cool? And at that time, uh, nobody knew about Alan Wake, but somehow, apparently, you seem to need this distance to kind of be able to picture it properly. I think we have time for one more, hopefully. There's another. Um, do you have any plans to make like cool games like Dust and Eve to Xbox 360? Uh, so I, I can't really tell what, what the long-term plans are. I mean, our, our initial launch is going to be on PlayStation 3. Uh, and uh, and all, everything that comes after that, it, for me, is like some, some business voodoo magic that happens completely outside of my realm. And, and uh, I mean, I, you know, I'd hope someday. But, but I mean, we're launching on PlayStation. And, and we might get one more in. Here. Uh, up in front. Um, hello, uh, thank you for coming here so, to this Nordic Fest. This question goes directly to Saku. Uh, question, you mentioned that uh, Alan Wake was, in, by the way, excellent game, one of my favorites in the last 10 years. You. Uh, you mentioned that it was influenced by Stephen King, Twin Peaks and all that stuff. Uh, what, you rec what recommendation would you give me in other medias that had that same flavor as Alan Wake, that kind of surrealistic, commonplace Americana? That's in Alan Wake. And another thing, can you tell us if American Nightmares is going to be the last of Alan Wake's adventure? Or can we expect more in the future? Um, I can't comment on that quite yet, unfortunately. Uh, there's going to be, well, uh, I let other people do the announcements, unfortunately. But, um, um, well, I wish our writer Sam Lake would be here. He surely tapped to a wide variety of of uh, different pop culture references, and we on the on the kind of a design side as well, a, we looked, for instance, a lot of well, Northern Exposure. <laughs> it just comes to mind, a classic TV show. Uh, we went to Roslyn, for instance, where it was shot in, in uh, not far from Seattle. Uh, it's a good good TV show. We we liked Lost. Uh, we watched movies. Insomnia was one of the great ones, uh, obviously. Uh, so there's quite a lot of medium where you, where you could look for, but I can't give you any better answer than that. I think you mentioned Twin Peaks too, right? Yeah, well, uh, you Did also you mentioned Twin Peaks. Okay. Uh, that was a really big thing. It kind of really went well in Finland in the early 90s when it originally came. And it, uh, we, you can't make game for four years if you don't like what you're doing. And every time, with Max Payne, there was Hong Kong films. Uh, we all loved them back in the early 90s when they were kind of coming to Europe and coming to Western uh, awareness. And, and we loved those TV shows. So we tried to find stuff that gives us the goosebumps and, and to kind of be inspired by them and then figure out how to make that again. We've been told we have to stop right at 7, and all my digital devices say 7. 
Um, thank you all for being a great crowd and sticking with us. Uh, we hope the, the uh, discussion was engaging and intellectually stimulating. You can check out the guys' games. And if we do this again, come back. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you.